Thank you for coming, ladies and gentlemen. You've come to our factory, which is owned by BG Penny and Company Limited. And we do, we're, we're great, we're very proud to be hosting the new Brexit party, the launch. And this, this industrial factory, what it just a little bit about what we do, we do metal finishing. So we do shock blasting, metal spraying, powder coating. <coughs> it's all done in this factory. And a lot of it is export. A lot of it is used in this country. We do engineering architectural, military, various items. And um, we, we're very, very happy to host this event for us as the start of the Brexit party. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Nigel Farage. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So there is demand for a new party, is there? Yes. You know, in some ways I can scarcely believe I'm doing this because I did actually think when 498 MPs voted for Article 50, which said quite explicitly that we would leave the European Union on the 29th of March with or without a withdrawal agreement, I thought, well, we've won the referendum, 85% of us have voted for parties in the general election who say they will honour the result of the referendum, and then 498 of them have said it's going to happen. I, I did actually, rather stupidly, for a moment, believe that we'd won. Uh, but it became clear pretty early on, really, with the so-called negotiation, that our Remainer Parliament, our Remainer Cabinet, and indeed our Remainer Prime Minister, we're going to do their utmost to delay, dilute, and in many cases to actually stop and overturn Brexit. And I think what we've seen over the course of the last few weeks is the betrayal, willful betrayal, of the greatest democratic exercise in the history of this nation. And when I began to realise back in November, December, that extension was almost certain to come, that there would be more European elections. I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up a party. I'm going to call it the Brexit Party. But given that it's the most Googled word in the English language, I wonder whether the Electoral Commission will allow me to use the name. Well, they have. And you are here today at the birth, at the launch of a new force in British politics. Welcome to the Brexit Party. Uh, yeah. I haven't spent 25 years of my life fighting to raise the issue of why we should be an independent, normal, self-governing country that makes its own laws, has its own courts, controls its own borders. I haven't spent 25 years of my life doing that to simply roll over and to allow a career political class to betray that result without me fighting back. Well, the fight back begins here in Coventry today. And I think what's happened is our two-party system simply can't cope with Brexit. I think our two-party system has been exposed, frankly, as being unfit for purpose. I think we have a parliament that is now completely out of touch with our country. I think politics is broken. And I want to say this. This party is not here just to fight the European elections on the 23rd of May this year. This party is not here to ask people simply to express their anger by going to the ballot box and voting for us on that day. No, no. The 23rd of May is the first step of the Brexit party. Our task and our mission is to change 
politics for good, to change all aspects of politics in this country. I did say, I did say that if I ever had to come back into the political fray, next time it would be no more Mr Nice Guy. And I mean it. I mean it. I mean it. I am, I'm an, yes, I'm angry about what's happened. I know lots of people out there are angry. But this is not, as I say, a negative emotion. This is a positive emotion. We're going to use these elections to change things. I said many years ago that I wanted to cause an earthquake in British politics. Well, now, what I'm fighting for, and with your support, what we will attempt to achieve is a democratic revolution in British politics, because that is what we need. Now, even before... Even before we've launched the party, one or two very interesting and exciting things have begun to happen. Just over 10 days ago, the website went live, and we said to people, if you want to sign up as registered supporters, if you want to donate money to the party, we're open for business. And I think it's pretty remarkable that in the first 10 days of operation, we've managed to raise over three quarters of a million pounds from small donations from members of the public. I've never seen anything like that in my 25 years of campaigning. Um, and when I was asked this morning on the Today programme, on the BBC Today programme, I was asked what big donors do we have? I said, well, of course I'd welcome big donors, but wouldn't it be even more exciting if it was hundreds of thousands of small donors that funded the rebirth of democracy in this country. <laughs> because that is what it's about. It's about democracy. Our democratic decision is being willfully overturned. And this is coming in the country that has what was once called the mother of parliaments. And I can tell you that all over the world, our friends, and I, I do know one or two quite highly placed politicians in some other uh, English-speaking countries of the world, and all over the world, people look on with incredulity because they still think that we're a great country. And the funny thing is that we, the people, still think that we're a great country, but our leaders our leaders are happy to continue down the path of managed decline. I genuinely believe right now this nation, we are lions led by donkeys. And not only are our leaders weak, not only have they willfully betrayed this result, but they're also pretty much incompetent. They're not actually very good at what they do. They're not very good at anything. Too many of them, too many of them have been down the path of going straight from Oxford to become a researcher, to become a member of parliament in their late 20s, They've got no experience of the real world. They are classic career politicians because to them, getting re-elected matters more than anything else. They're not in politics out of passion. They're not in politics out of a cause. And, and in many ways, you can understand why career politicians would embrace the European project. Uh, it's a wonderful safety net for anybody that fails in national politics. But they do look incompetent. And what? I've been astonished by with the Brexit party is the quality of people who've now decided enough's enough. The quality of people who are putting their names forward to be candidates for this European election and thousands more already who've applied to stand for us in local elections, in general elections, in by-elections and whatever else it may be. And I also want to emphasise that amongst this remarkable talent we've got from men and women who will be standing on our list. And I do believe that the list that we will put before the British public 
on May the 23rd will be the most impressive list of candidates any political party has ever put before the British public in history. I genuinely believe that, and I mean that. We have many people on these lists who do deals every day, who do deals every week. So it's time the political class who've shown themselves incapable of doing a good deal were pushed aside and replaced by those who know how the real world works. Of course, there'll be questions about broader issues of policy, and we'll come to that in time. But for now, we are focused on the 23rd of May. For now, we are focused on this question of democracy, this question of trust, and indeed, this question of competence. How are we going to do? Well, I don't know. But I have been to the bookmakers this morning. <laughs> and I remember in the run-up to the referendum, when it was four to one against Leave winning, and I went into a bookmakers in London and put down a bet. Uh, oh, and how everybody thought it was so terribly funny. Well, I did manage to collect my winnings. <laughs> and I've this morning, I have this morning put a thousand pounds on the Brexit party <laughs> to, to top the poll in the European election at the odds of three to one. Who's to say? I don't know. All I can say, all I can say is this first step in our journey to change politics for the good, this first beginning of this fight back, all I can say is we are going to provide the British people with a decent, respectable, competent political vehicle that they can believe in and they can vote for. And after that, well, it's not up to us, is it? It's then up to the public in this country. I think... I think we're going to set something exciting, a spark. It's going to happen over the course of the next few weeks. I, I do believe that we can win these European elections and that we can again start to put the fear of God into our members of Parliament in Westminster. They deserve nothing less than that after the way they've treated us over this betrayal. I really do believe that Britain needs the Brexit party and will do whatever we can over the course of the next few weeks to provide that respectable vehicle for those who want us. And let's just remind ourselves what this referendum was about. It wasn't about some economic prognosis from the CBI that we might be worse off or a view of many of the entrepreneurs that support us that we're going to be a lot better off. It wasn't about that. The referendum was a very simple choice. Did we wish to stay part of a political union or did we wish to become an independent, self-governing nation? And we, Leavers in this country, none of them have changed their minds. In fact, in many ways, the Leave vote has hardened in this country. And there are equally many people who voted Remain who believe that democracy is so fundamental to this country, to who we are as a people, that unless Unless the will of the people is carried out, something would have changed in our, in our nation forever. So I think, with a bit of luck and a following wind, trying our hardest, I think we can turn this around. I know this is a, a battle that we shouldn't be having to fight, but we are having to fight it, and we are going to win it. Thank you. Now, let me introduce you to a selection, just a, a, a handful of the 70 candidates that will be standing for us in England, Scotland and Wales on May the 23rd. And can I please welcome to the stage Annunciata Rees-Mogg. Hello, 
as Nigel has said, my name is Annunciata Rees-Mogg, and I am here today in sadness. I am here in sadness that our democracy has been so betrayed that I feel the need to be here. For the last eight years, I've been a full-time mother. I didn't think I would ever be back on the political scene. I wanted to avoid the negative comments that people throw all over the place and the violence that can come from putting your name above the parapet and standing for what you believe in. I didn't want my children to have to suffer that, but my country needs to be recognized in the democratic way that it has called for. Our politicians need to listen to what the people have said. I joined the Conservative Party in 1984. This is not a decision I have made lightly to leave a party for which I have fought at every election since 1987, from Maggie Thatcher through to Theresa May. I know which one I'd rather have representing us now. Within the Conservative Party, there have been good times, but there have been quite bleak times where I wondered what our leaders were doing and I had serious questions, but I stuck by them through thick and thin. But at the point at which our Prime Minister will not listen not only to her membership, but will not listen to the people of her country, 17.4 million of them, many of whom had never voted before, but believed in bringing back control, I can't sit by and let her do it. It is our fight and we must fight to win. There have been scare stories, left, right and centre. Oddly, we seem to have less to fear from WTO than the EU. It is them that should be trying to avoid it. When it comes to tariffs, the majority of the world operates on WTO, and it is the world that is growing as Europe and the European Union economies stagnate. We should be looking further afield. We should not have fear. We should have belief. We know we are a great nation, and for that, we should be proud. We should stand up, we should fight for our futures, for our children's futures, but most importantly, we should trust the people. In 2003, I founded a campaign called Trust the People because it's what I so fundamentally believe in. We've got to rescue our democracy. We have got to show that the people of this country have a say in how we are run, that the politicians are not our masters, they are to do our bidding. We must fight back not only of control from the European Union, but fight back for control of our own democracy. The stakes are that high. This is a fundamental moment for all of us for our futures and to shape how things go forward. I cannot put up with the despondency on the streets. I cannot bear to see the anger amongst the people this country's elected members have ignored. We must fight their fight, we must win the fight, and we must leave for a greater future and better politics. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I was also asked this morning on the Today programme, whose votes were we targeting? Were we targeting Tory votes? Were we targeting Labour votes? And the truth of it is, we're targeting the millions of people out there who voted Conservative and who voted Leave. We're targeting millions of people who in previous times voted UKIP and voted Leave. And we're not going to forget for one minute the five million people out there 
who voted to leave and who also voted Labour. Very, very important we get that message out there. Very important indeed. Let me introduce my next candidate to the stage, Ben Habib. Well, thank you, Malcolm, for welcoming us to your uh, industrial facilities in the heartlands of the manufacturing sector in Great Britain. I am delighted to be here. My name is Ben Habib. I'm founder and chief executive of a company called First Property Group. I've been very politically aware all my life. I've been a Tory voter and more recently a Tory donor. I've never been politically active. But the reason I have stood up today and joined the Brexit party is because of, essentially because of this document. I just want to remind you all about this document. It was a document that David Cameron circulated at a cost of 9.4 million pounds in the run up to the referendum. 23 pages long, 22 pages dedicated to all the fear that we must take on board if we were to leave the European Union. But two very critical points were made in this document. The first was, and I'll just read it to you, the government will implement what you decide. And secondly, that this is the vote of a generation. The government didn't proceed to deliver what we decided. The government proceeded, well, in David Cameron's case, he resigned virtually immediately. Theresa May made a couple of good speeches at the outset, which was very encouraging for people like me. And then she proceeded to slip slide to the awful position in which the United Kingdom now finds itself. I do deals for a living, that's precisely what I do do. And the last thing I will ever do is take no deal off the table. It's absolutely bonkers. <laughs> if you take no deal off the table, what you're signaling to your counterparty is that you will sign, it's a logical consequence, you will sign any deal that they put in front of you. In other words, Parliament has condemned this country to unconditional surrender. I have a one minute warning, so I've got to, I've got to be brief, but I want to talk a bit about the, I want to talk very briefly about the economy. The whole Remain argument centers on the economy. Every day in the run-up to the referendum, we heard about what a disaster it would be if you voted to leave. Well, that disaster didn't happen. Every day now, we hear about what a disaster it would be if we were to leave without a no deal. I had the Chancellor, I heard the Chancellor on Sophie Ridge the other day saying that it would be catastrophic if we left without a deal. He's our flipping Chancellor. He shouldn't allow the country to get to a position where it could be catastrophically bad for us. But let me tell you, there is nothing that to, to, to be feared from no deal. People don't trade with the United Kingdom because we're in the European Union. They trade with the United Kingdom because they, have, they want to buy our goods, they want to sell us their goods. Trade deals are not a prerequisite for trade. They just are nice to have. We will be absolutely fine without a deal with the European Union. I've run my business successfully through the boom period as well as the credit crunch. Economies change, markets change, legislation changes, social behavior changes, buying pattern changes, internet and the te technological in environment in which we operate change. Businesses are subject to change all the time. If we think the imposition of a small number of tariffs is going to knock Great Britain off its legs, then we've lost the plot and I'm out of time. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Well, just to back up Ben's point, as Malcolm Penny showed me around the factory this morning, I saw um, some of the spray painting work that was going on, um, and I said, well, where are those goods destined for? The United States of America with whom we trade under WTO rules. It's not that difficult, really, is it? 
I want to introduce to you our next candidate, who is June Mummery. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Coventry. My name is June Mummery, business owner and founding member of Reef, Renaissance of the East Anglian Fisheries. I represent fishermen from Kings Lynn all the way down to the Thames estuary. I have been fighting continuously for the past two and a half years to secure a brighter future for our coastal communities post-Brexit, which have been left behind by governments past and present. I want to ensure this changes. Brexit is a golden opportunity to rejuvenate our fishing industry, realise our vast potential to become as successful as Norway, Faroe and Iceland. We have a vision and a sustainable plan to make our coastal towns prosper once again. We must take back full control of our precious ocean and the fish within it. There are billions of pounds worth of fish to be caught and processed in our country, creating jobs and wealth. One job at sea produces eight jobs on land. The UK fishing industry could be worth a staggering 1.6 billion catch value and 6.3 billion net to plate value. I have lobbied hard towards the banning of electric pulse fishing exercised by the Dutch fish fishing fleet in community waters. This barbaric, unethical method of fishing kills the biodiversity that makes up the very ecology of our sea. Our ca campaign has been a success. Pulse fishing is to be banned in the sea. Our campaign has been absolutely wonderful. Our campaign has been a very big success. Pulse fishing is banned in our European waters. This is first-hand evidence of what passionate UK citizens can achieve when we work together. The UK has some of the richest fishing grounds in the world. We are tired of watching the Dutch, French and other EU countries plunder our natural resource. We wear the crown and we are throwing the diamonds, emeralds and rubies away. We must scrap the common fishery policy, take back full control of our waters and take full control of our country and our destiny to make our country great again. Thank you. June, thank you. And our next candidate is Alka Segal Cuthbert. I'm Alka Segal Cuthbert and I'm a teacher, but I'll try to be not too teachery. But I do think it's worth um, having a little bit of a historical perspective, uh, which will explain why I think we need to leave the EU and why I'm standing. I think the question of democracy is central. It's taken centuries for societies to go from being ruled by myths and taboos to monarchs who, are, who, are, who rule by divine right to social democratic forms of governance, which are based on the majority vote and where the governments get their legitimacy from their citizens through de democratic mandates. I think it's one, you know, the idea of one per citizen's vote being equivalent to any others, irrespective of religion, employment status, cultural preferences, or what have you. That fundamental principle has been the basis of equality and the basis of a level of social solidarity that made Britain a place that my dad wanted to come to in the early 60s from India. He was a teacher and he stood as a local Labour candidate, probably the first non-white in that particular uh, London suburb at the time. Um, and he came not for money and not for access to services, 
but he came because of that democratic principle, a principle that respected democracy and autonomy as a general rule for everybody, not just if you were rich or if you were academically qualified or if you had the right beliefs. And I think this, since the referendum and all the developments subsequent, we've seen that even as an ideal, that principle of democracy is so weak, it doesn't really exist anymore because over the past quarter of a century, our political class, that's from all parties, have spent their time and efforts, along with their friends in Europe, to create an institutional structure of political regulation that, in the words of one academic who I am happy to quote, has depoliticized the economy and de-democratized politics. And that's had... <laughs> and, and that... That is not just a question, that does not just affect the narrow sphere of politics in Parliament. That has had ramifications throughout our lives because our institutional professions, our institutional structures have been recast. You know, these are things through which most people live our lives. Mums, teachers, nurses, fishmongers, everybody lives their lives through these institutions and they have been recast from away from democratic principles into technocratic um, rule-bound things that kind of squeeze the space for human judgment and human experience. And the effects of that, I think as a teacher, I've seen how that's affected my profession, and I know people who work in the healthcare, and their, their profession is similarly affected, not just by material cutbacks, but by a profound demoralization. And I think it's time to re-democratize and re-moralize politics. Um, I don't think... <laughs> I don't think parties who are committed to technocratic forms of governments can do it. I don't think academics can do it, even if they're from Harvard or Cambridge, where, where I studied. I think it can only be done through the widest public engagement. The process has been started already, not by Nigel, powerful as he is and, and charismatic as he may be to some, but it's actually been done by everybody, and I mean everybody who voted in the referendum, whether it was remain or leave. Right? And so it's, this isn't just about that anymore. It's about respecting that democratic vote. The Remainers might have been aligned with the politi sorry, political class this time, but, but if they let this democratic principle go, next time when you vote, who's to say the government will respect anything, right? So it can't be... It can't be done by them. It's got to be done as the taxi drivers in Luton are discovering as they're struggling to maintain their, their living standards. It can only be done by ourselves, not ourselves as frightened, isolated individuals, fearful for our reputations. But we've got to, we've got to understand ourselves as citizens who are equal. We're able to argue. We're able to find points of consensus as well as realise through arguing what is non-negotiable. And through that process, through that messy human political process, arrive at consensuses, consensus decisions, which we did in that referendum. Um, it's called independent thinking, it's called democracy, and I think it's worth fighting for. Alka, thank you. Well, they're just four of the candidates that will be standing for us on the 23rd of May. I hope you agree with me. We've got some very, very capable and able people that are going to be running for this party. Somebody, people actually of quality that our voters can go out and vote for. And I think they're all terrific. But there's one more I must introduce you to. Our final speaker of the morning, who also is going to be standing in the European elections on our list and takes over from this moment as party chairman which means I've got far less to do. So I'm delighted. Please welcome Richard Tice. <laughs> it's all been fine. I didn't say anything. Just carry on. Good morning. Thank you, Nigel. And thank you, firstly, to reiterate the thanks to the Penny family for hosting us here so warmly and generously. It is... 
It is wonderful to be amongst a long-standing family business, the sort of business that actually is the bedrock of the UK economy and of which we should be incredibly proud. I've been a businessman and an entrepreneur for over 30 years. I've been involved in running small, medium and large companies, including a billion pound multinational business listed on the stock market where we tripled the share price in just four years. I've built thousands of homes. I've been involved in creating tens and tens of thousands of jobs in the construction center, uh, in the construction sector. And I've attracted hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds of investment into this country from overseas. And I've been a lifelong member of the Conservative Party. But like many, I've concluded that frankly, enough is enough. We cannot, we cannot, we must not, and we will not allow this complete and utter shambles in Westminster to continue. We all know that the UK can do so much better than this. And that's why I've agreed to chair the new Brexit party. And let's just take a step back and just pause for a moment amongst all the noise and the angst. Let's just remember, let's celebrate the fact that we are an incredibly proud, strong, confident, amazing country. Let's just celebrate that. <laughs> amongst all the noise in Westminster, we forget we're one of the top six economies in the world. We're a permanent member of the G7, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, part of the Five Eyes Security Network. We're the head of the amazing Commonwealth countries around the world. We have the best trained armed forces in the world, three of the top 10 universities. London is the greatest capital city in the world with one of the leading financial centers. These are huge achievements to celebrate. We also, of course, have the greatest football league in the world. <laughs> and despite all the, the noise again, people forget, in 2018, thanks to Brexit, this great economy of ours outperformed Germany, France, Italy. We're employing record numbers of people. Unemployment is at record lows. And thanks to Brexit, wages are increasing faster than inflation. So we have so much to be optimistic about. And yet our current crop of politicians seem to be pessimistic. We are poised to go from strength to strength. But that, ladies and gentlemen, requires confident, bold, optimistic leadership. <laughs> what we've had. And instead of that, we've seen an utter total humiliation on the international stage. The absurd sight of our Prime Minister writing not one, but two begging letters to overseas leaders in the space of a fortnight. You literally couldn't make it up if you were writing a fiction book. We have an incompetent government, incapable negotiating teams, and politicians who say and write one thing in a manifesto and then conspire amongst themselves to do dodgy, dirty, backroom deals in Westminster. Many politicians seem happy to sell our country, this great nation, down the river by tying us, strapping us into a straitjacket with this woeful withdrawal agreement. It is truly the worst deal in history, and yet they recommend that we sign it. And not only would this straitjacket have a padlock, but the key to that padlock would be given to bureaucrats in Brussels. You really couldn't make it up. And the other people that have been found out in this process are the civil service. They're not up to the job. And only this morning we learn that yesterday, politicians and the civil service seem to think that it's a good idea to stop no deal preparations. You couldn't make it up, ladies and gentlemen. They should be ramping it up. They should be using this time to make sure that all the T's 
are crossed. All the I's are dotted so that not only are we ready, but actually we're going to leave on a WTO Brexit because that is the way that we maximise our negotiating leverage. That's the way to get the best deal for this country, not to stop no deal preparations. As Ben said earlier, that is a, an appalling business negotiating tactic. And as we sit here or stand here today, it's unbelievable that in this country, the mother of all democracies, the very essence of trust in democracy is being destroyed. And it's utterly tragic when thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who never voted before, they showed that confidence in the referendum. And now they're questioning, saying, why would we ever bother to vote again? Enough is enough. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, we must find, fight back. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, we must change politics for good in this country. Because we all know. We all know. We all know that this country deserves so much better. That's why the Brexit Party is going to do things differently. We stand for competent, capable, common sense politics. We, st we know that Brexit creates a huge opportunity for optimism, for growth, for renewal in the United Kingdom. We've just got to grasp it. It's time we took on the vested interests. It's time we took on the establishment. It's time we took on the civil service. We need to change fundamentally the way this country is run so that it's run for the people. <laughs> never again, never again, ladies and gentlemen, should we ever, ever allow ourselves to be humiliated in this way. But if we carry on under this current leadership, we know what will happen. We'll be here on the 31st of October, Halloween night, and we'll be writing another begging letter. It must stop. So that's why. That's why we are so proud of the incredible quality of hundreds and hundreds of applicants to stand as candidates for this new party. And it's great to see the first four that we announced today. And as we announce the remaining candidates over the next couple of weeks, you will see specialist skills, real knowledge, great experience, success from entrepreneurs, from academics, from doctors, from people from the military. That's the sort of quality that we need to bring into politics to make this difference. And not only did thousands, hundreds and hundreds of people apply to be candidates, but it is deeply humbling that thousands and thousands and thousands of people across the country have online made donations to help start this new movement, this new party. That is deeply humbling for those of us that are leading it. And it's also extraordinary the number of activists and volunteers and local associations of other political parties who've been phoning up saying, can we help? Can we get involved? What do we need to do? We're with you, just tell us when. Something is changing. There is a huge movement, ladies and gentlemen. This is a time to change politics for good in this country. And we say to anybody that says, well, these EU elections are not worth voting for. Why should I bother? I'll tell you why you should bother. Everybody for the first time should vote in these elections because this is an opportunity to send a very clear, very strong, very powerful West message to Westminster. It's a chance for a springboard to transform politics. People want change. People want better people running our country, better leaders. People want quality people spending taxpayers' money, our money, wisely, better, and to stop the waste. People want faster decisions. In the world of business, we have a can-do, make-things-happen sort of approach. And that's what we need for the people running this country. 
If this country was run like a well-run, lean, successful business, we would all be in a much, much better place. So I say to you, never has the opportunity been greater. Never has the appetite for change been stronger. We can do this. We can restore trust in democracy, which is absolutely fundamental. We can send a very clear, positive message to Westminster. We can make Brexit an incredible success. We just need new quality leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, let's believe in Britain. So, so, that's enough from me. I may have gone on a little bit. We're passionate about this stuff. And I'm sure, I'm sure also that no doubt members of the press and anybody uh, are passionate to ask some questions. So who would like to kick off? Hi. I'd like to ask Michael this question. Back in 2010, there was a phrase, we believe in Nick. The millennials paid for the mistrust in that individual. What I see here... Good morning. Greatly imp Not um. Microphone issue. Do your best. In 2010, there's a slogan, I believe in Nick. The greatest misrepresentation from the general to the millennials, as we know, as a generation. Nigel, I come from Labour. I'm appalled at what Corbyn is doing, talking to the devil in our net. You will need a social policy. I'm surprised the key to the Stuart is not here, to reach his heartlands, to use the have-nots as a way forward. You need to offer those people hope in terms of housing, fighting zero hours contracts, struggling from hand to mouth. When is a social policy coming forward? You don't want to fall into the trap, my friend, of the haves, letting the have-nots. It is the have-nots that will take this party forward and I urge you to make that representation. Bring the people of Calibre forward and not more of the same. Well, look, you know, the point I made to you was this, that, that our first electoral test is going to be on the 23rd of May. It's going to be a European election. It's going to be a European issue. It's also going to be a proportional representation election. And we're going to fight those European elections on democracy, on trust, and on competence. All right? And I promise you, I promise you, we will put out begin the beginnings of a broader manifesto thereafter. And yes, we will put the British people first and give everybody opportunity and of course our policies will have a social dimension, I promise you, of that. Yes, there we go. Just, Grace, have you got someone just there? Just here? Hi. Hi there, uh, Josh Halliday from The Guardian. Um, Nigel, um, how is the Brexit party different from UKIP? And aren't you in danger of helping the two legacy parties, as you call them, by, sp by splitting the pro-Brexit vote? Well, look, I mean, I think that uh, UKIP and the Brexit party are very different. Um, UKIP was a big part of my life. I was a member of it for 26 years. Indeed, I gave it many of the best years of my adult life. Um, and we did achieve, I think, some pretty remarkable success with it. Uh, one of the things that I always did, and yeah, sure, I talked about tough issues, I talked about things that others would rather just brush under the carpet, but when I was leader of UKIP, we didn't allow anybody to even be a member if they'd formerly been part of the EDL or the BNP or any organisation like that. In fact, I think we were unique in political parties in outright banning people from those backgrounds. And I'm afraid, and I did my very best during the course of last year to warn UKIP not to go down that route. They have decided to go down a route where there seems to be an, a complete obsession 
uh, not just with Islam, but it would appear with it, all of its adherents. Uh, they've attracted um, a fairly, shall I say, loutish fringe, and we certainly saw that uh, when we had the Leave Means Leave rally after the march from Sunderland uh, the other day in Parliament Square. You know, what kicked off um, with UKIP in Whitehall that evening was pretty unsavoury, and I don't think that Middle England, decent people, want to vote for a political party that is linked to extremism, violence, criminal records and thuggery. That's why I left UKIP. <laughs> that is why I left UKIP, and it was a difficult thing for me to do. It really was. However, I now look back at it and think, well, maybe UKIP served its purpose. Maybe it did what it was set up to do. It did precipitate that referendum. Uh, but the Brexit Party is not here just to talk about the European issue. Uh, the Brexit Party, and, and you know, the very word Brexit is no longer just about leaving the European Union. The word Brexit represents a state of mind. The word Brexit represents the great battle of our day. And that battle is the people versus the politicians. That is what Brexit means. And this party is not just about going out with the intention of winning those European elections. It's not just about making sure that that referendum is delivered on. We are about fundamentally changing politics in this country. Hi there, yes. Hi, Trish. because it's the heart of England, that's why. I, mean, I, I, I think it's the easiest question I've ever been asked. We're launching it in the heart of England. We're launching it in a successful family-run business. Uh, and by doing it here, we're sending a message. We are a party that understands business. We're a party that understands the importance of business. Uh, and we're pretty tired of the argument that we hear from multinational businesses and career politicians that somehow business is in favour of the customs union. Business is in favour of the single market. And actually, there are vast numbers of businesses out there that do not want to be regulated at a European level and understand, as we do, there is a bigger, better, more exciting future with a broader world out there. Hi. Yes, just in. Hi. Hi Nigel, I'm Mark Cardwell from SWNS News Agency. Just wanted to ask what your feeling is at the moment about a second referendum and would you be worried that Leave uh, wouldn't win this time? It's <laughs> another easy question. The, you cannot have a second referendum until you implement the first referendum. I'm, 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 very, I'm, I'm very comfortable. No, no. I'm very happy with the second referendum. We had one in 1975, and then we had one in 2016. And all right, the world moves a bit faster these days. Give it 20 years, have another referendum, and that's fine. If, however, if, however, we're forced into having a second referendum, I think the first thing to say is that the question has to be the right question. Now, the idea that it would be Mrs May's treaty against the existing European treaties would be an outrage. And if that was put to us, well, I did say, actually, that I'd spend the day down the pub. But I'm a somewhat reformed character now. So, so what I would do is go and spoil my ballot paper. We have to have a proper question if there is to be a second referendum. And I will say this to you. And it's very interesting how large sections of our commentariat and our media are completely ignoring what has happened in the last five weeks in this country, which is a dramatic shift in the opinion polls, a dramatic shift towards leaving on WTO terms. Now, every single region of England and Wales, with the exception of London, now has majorities, big majorities. In the case of the Midlands, it's a 16% majority of people here who want to leave with no deal as opposed to remaining. So, I think we'd win anyway. Hi. Hi, I'm from the Commentary Observer. You issued a specific appeal to 
to attract uh, business people, uh, people who do deals, entrepreneurs, and to avoid politicians. Uh, you're in the traditional industrial heartland, as you said. Um, and, and we hear uh, very often from chambers of commerce in the region, from prominent business people, that there is a, a, a direct threat to thousands of jobs in this region and, and, and market uncertainty caused by Brexit. What does this party say to those people who are seriously worried about whether they will have a job next year? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, your point about market uncertainty is a well-made point. Absolutely. The longer this drags on, the more this Prime Minister kicks the can down the road, the more market uncertainty there is. I, I mean, every business has to deal with changing conditions. Every business has to deal with differing social trends. Every business has to deal with different legislation. Every business has to deal, if it trades overseas, with the fact that some of your markets are going through recession and some are going through extraordinary periods of growth. Uh, the one thing that I've found, certainly speaking to business people, entrepreneurs in business, is they just say, just get it done, get it over with, tell us what the cards are, we will adapt and adjust to whatever those circumstances are. And as for the jobs point, well, you know, we were told by George Osborne, remember him, that if we voted leave, he would have to hold an emergency budget. That if we voted leave, half a million jobs would go immediately. The financial sector would lose 300,000 jobs very, very quickly. I mean, he didn't quite tell us that plagues of black locusts would descend upon our land, but it wasn't very far away. Um, and as been said from this platform already, uh, the one area of the British economy that is suffering is investment. And that is because of the continuing uncertainty and not knowing what resolution there is. But by every measure, he was wrong. And you know, the same people who talked to me about the fact jobs could be lost are the same people who told me if we didn't join the euro, it would be a catastrophe. The same people who told me the exchange rate mechanism would be good for our country and it would be a disaster. So you do tend to find that there are two business voices. There is a corporate voice generally coming from very big companies who want to keep things exactly as they are. They are very happy with European regulation, as much European regulation as possible, because what that does is it actually stops new entrants coming into the market, keeps prices high, so you find corporates will be in favour of a regulated European model, but actually amongst SMEs and elsewhere, many think there could be huge benefits from us leaving the European Union. Either way, the real answer is, whatever the circumstances are, Britain adapts, and we are an entrepreneurial country, we're a global trading nation, we will do absolutely brilliantly in the future, and I feel freed from those shackles, and particularly getting out of the customs union, and being able to do our own negotiations around the world, why would you tie yourself inextricably to what is just 15% of the world's economy and in 10 years' time might not be much bigger than 5%. I'll just, just to reiterate that, let's just remember, despite George Osborne's warnings, we're actually employing over a million people more now than at the time of the referendum. And, and you talk about chambers of commerce, and let's just think the biggest business group the CBI. They have been wrong every single time. They resisted the Thatcher right reforms. They said we shouldn't leave the ERM. Thank heavens we did. They said we should join the Euro. Thank heavens we didn't. And then at the time of the referendum, they said it would be a disaster. It wasn't. It's a springboard to success. Whatever the CBI recommend, ladies and gentlemen, if you do the opposite, you'll be much better off. <laughs> I, and it is, they can't even tell the truth about the size of their own membership. Enough said. So, next question. Thanks very much. Um, Alex Morales from Bloomberg News. Um, Nigel Farage, I was wondering um, if you could say how much you think the European elections might be a proxy for a second referendum. And you said you put money on the Brexit party. How well do you rate the chances of the pro-Remain, pro-second referendum parties? 
Well, it's an interesting question because there are uh, quite a lot. I mean, there was a question asked earlier about splitting the vote on the, on the EU withdrawal side with UKIP, and I think I gave, the, gave an argument as to why I think the glass ceiling on UKIP is now really quite low. Uh, that's my view. When it comes to pro-Remain parties, well, you've got uh, the SNP, pro-Remain, the Greens, pro-Remain, Plaid, pro-Remain, uh, you've got the Liberal Democrats, pro-Remain, you've got Chucker and his chums, pro-Remain, uh, you've got uh, the Labour Party, well, pretty much now, pro-Remain, uh, because they want us to stay part of the customs union and basically the single market too. And then you've got the Conservative Party, past, no idea where they stand on anything. Um, so it, it does seem to me that actually, that actually, that all, you know, the split in the vote, the split in the vote is going to be on the Remain side, it seems to me. Do I think, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I suppose if I had to have another bet, because I like betting, it's good fun. Uh, I would bet that Change UK will beat the Liberal Democrats quite comfortably. I think the Liberal, the Liberal Democrat brand looks pretty redundant at the moment. Will this referendum turn into a, into a proxy for a second referendum is a really interesting question. The answer to that can only really be if we have a big turnout. You know, last time the turnout for the European elections was around about 36%. If we get a very big turnout, it could. Uh, but it depends a bit how many votes the Conservatives get, because the Conservatives, you know, it'll be tough to say whether they're a Leave party or a Remain party. So I don't think it really becomes a proxy for a second referendum, but I do think, I genuinely do think, even if, even if the Remain parties did well, that doesn't really pose a great threat to the Labour Party on its current trajectory, it doesn't pose a great threat necessarily to the Conservative Party. But what I do know is, if the Brexit Party does very well, that poses a very big threat to both the Conservative and Labour parties and will shift the centre of gravity of this argument a little bit closer, back towards the people where it needs to be. Great. Question, please. Hi. Uh, Nigel, what's your message to Jacob Rees-Mogg and the ERG apart from join us? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that uh, when it comes to questions about the Rees-Mogg family, I may leave that to others uh, to answer this morning. Um, look, I think, the, I think just as we had the Maastricht rebels back 26, 27 years ago, um, you know, the ERG have fought you know, a very effective rear guard. Uh, but in the end, in the end, what they've got to decide, you know, as conservative Eurosceptics, is is the Conservative Party the solution to the problem or is the Conservative Party the problem itself? And I decided back after Maastricht that, that, that it was the Conservative Party and indeed the Labour Party too that are the problem. And, 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 and look, I think British politics needs to be realigned. I don't think uh, these two parties frankly can cope with Brexit. Uh, I don't think the two-party the, the, the two system is fit for purpose. And look, I know it's very ambitious. I know it's very bold. But what we are trying to do is change politics for good, completely reshape the British political system. That is our ambition. And you know what? We're going to try our damnedest. Right. We've got two more questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alex Thompson, Channel 4 News. Uh, question for Nigel, <laughs> remarkably. Um, now, there's a lot of understandable anger directed here this morning against Parliament. But Parliament is only a mirror image of a very divided nation or nations. That gives you a huge problem. As the referendum demonstrated in terms of who voted which way, surely that gives you a huge problem going into this election. Alka talked about the way democracy works that you have a majority in democracy and you respect that majority and, and, and you wait for next time if you want to get your own back electorally. That is how our system has evolved. It's how it's worked. The reason we have division in this country, some division in this country, is because a substantial number of the big business and political elites refused to accept the result of the referendum. That is why we have division in this country. 
that is why we have uh, this new breed of person living in Britain, the militant Remainer. Uh, but actually, ask yourself overall, is this country divided? We have a political crisis in this country, absolutely. But we don't have a national crisis in this country. This is not the late 1970s where it was both a political and a national crisis. In fact, and what this polling is showing, what this big shift in the last five weeks in the opinion polls is showing, is that in fact people are coming together and saying one very simple thing, just get on with it. <laughs> last question, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Jennifer O'Connell from the Irish Times. Hi, um, question for Nigel. Nigil, if you He's are popular, isn't he? <laughs> um, if you are successful in making the case for leaving under WTO rules, how do you propose avoiding a hard border in Ireland and protecting peace on the island? Well, I don't know who's going to build this hard border. Because we're not going to build a hard border. The T shocker said that. The Republic of Ireland won't build a hard border. Mr. Barnier has said that the European Union isn't going to build a hard border. Whether Donald Trump's coming over or not, I'm not really sure. Uh, but it is fascinating that the European Parliament itself, back in early 2017, produced its own report how to deal with the Irish border in the event of a WTO Brexit. I thought it was fascinating three weeks ago when there was speculation about whether we would be leaving under WTO, you know, very firm statements. Under WTO, both the Commission and Dublin saying there'd be no hard border. And yet, and yet, with the withdrawal treaty, there was the backstop. So look, this is all nonsense. I believe in time. I mean, I do believe the quickest way to a free trade deal, the quickest way to make things easy, particularly for Irish beef farmers and people like that, um, is we leave on WTO rules and you know something? The European Union will come running down the street after us wanting a tariff-free deal. But that, you know, that is how we get there. The only, other, the only other issue, of course, would be product standards. And I understand that because outside the single market, we would not be subject to the same rules imposed from Brussels. But you know what? After 44 years of regulatory alignment, you know, the day we leave, and actually for a long time afterwards, the products are going to be on the same spec. Uh, and you know, because we're leaving the European Union, we are not in this country going to lower our standards to third world level. It simply isn't going to happen. And I think the Irish border, very cleverly, was put up by Monsieur Barnier to be this insoluble problem. And our Prime Minister, and it's remarkable this if you think about it, on the 8th of December 2017, because of a deadline set by an unelected bureaucrat called Monsieur Barnier, the British Prime Minister left Downing Street at 4.15 in the morning to fly to Brussels to meet his deadline. And there in desperation, she signed up to the backstop, and it's been a disaster ever since, all I can say is I wish Barnier was on our side, not Mrs. May. I just, I'm just going to finish on this point. People underestimate the European Union's own expert in his report on the border said that existing technology could deal with the issue. And it's unbelievable. It's part of the problem that I referred to earlier, that our own politicians, our own civil service, didn't hold them to their word. Instead, they fell for it because actually it suited them. They wanted to create a problem because they want to keep the status quo. They don't want to improve things for the people. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our um, press conference and launch this morning. I just want to reiterate my thanks to the Penny family for hosting us. My thanks to all of you who've come to be with us this morning. My thanks to Nigel and the candidates and please have a very safe trip home. Thank you very much. <laughs>